There's a tall ship's regatta in a couple of weeks. She keeps spotting the posters in town, all clip art and misplaced apostrophes. She's loved them since she was a toddler. Her old man would hoist her up and she'd ride on hairy shoulders, gasping. There's one at the quayside now. It's called the Something Da Vinci. It might not be in the regatta, but it's tall. Behind it, the power station, devoid of ambience in daylight. In darkness, it glows in honeycomb, a looming presence at the quayside. She prefers the place at night time, of course she does, but on a sunny day like this, there's irresistible charm. She walks for planks, chuckling, dreams of diving in. Like Ophelia, she'd float on the oily surface between the Morrison's bags and the seaweed. Two spliffs in, she wonders, if the wind turbines spun fast enough, would they become propellers and take Blythe to the moon? She smiles at swastikas sprayed on the shutters of a UKIP shop in town. Despairs at schoolmates stood queuing at the desk. You can get to Newcastle City Centre in one hour on the bus, but it's rare they ride further than Whitley Bay. Roundabouts and rituals, comforts and complacencies, mind under matter. Most days she utterly loves this town, apart from the tall ship's regatta. My name is Matt Abbott. Uh, welcome to this week's Nymphs and Fugs Insta Session. I've um, been hosting these every week since back in May. Um, I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been a bit of a lifeline for me. Um, and I've had some great comments from people who watch them as well. Um, really excited this week to have Rick Dove uh, performing the Insta Session. Rick is a poet and storyteller based in London, whose debut collection, Tales from the Other Box, was published by the wonderful Burning Eye Books back in August. So, I shall... Ah... <sighs> Oliver Waters off in East London, so I've had a bit of a mare over the last 20 minutes, but, you know, I've got beer, so. Hiya, mate, you all right? <laughs> yeah, not too bad. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, I've got, the, I've got the phone on the tripod, but I've been trying to use something else. So give me a second. Give me a second. That's all right, mate. No worries. Still getting used to all these uh, lockdown technologies. I've got a tripod on mine. It's actually a selfie stick tripod as well. I can't believe I had to buy a selfie stick. But it's, you know, it's worth it. <laughs> I was out with Mark Coverdale last night. He was singing your praises. Fab, fab. It's good. Can you still see me? Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. <laughs> Just on your side. Well, that's all right. Yeah. It's a problem that matter. Oh, well. How, how are you feeling? Yeah, not too, too bad. Not too, too bad. We've got, um, got used to the new normal now. It's... Um, Got a nice little routine going, working, got a nice little spot to work from. I finally found a room which works for uh, noise leakage and recording things. Um, so oh. it's working. It's working. Good. As long as you can keep going and keep writing and functioning as a poet, that's the main thing, isn't it, really? Because obviously your book came out in August, didn't it? So how it was that? Did. It did. The light, the, it was all really, really good. We had a very good launch, um, sold quite a few copies from that um yeah it's been it's really really good i only spotted one typo in the whole thing which is good um <laughs> and, uh, uh, it, you have to hold your hands up to uh, the typos that make it through six or seven different proofs and all of that and uh, yeah and it still makes it through it's fantastic so uh, there is one in there i'll see if anyone can find it um but uh yeah it's been good the chances of you publishing a first edition without any typos is, is almost, it's, it's never going to happen. It's fine. It's, it's almost part of the fun, in a way, trying to spot it. It got through. Um, yeah, so how long, that, this collection, um, it, was it, is it all relatively new work or is it a body of work that you've been building up over the years? Because you've been gigging for a, a, quite a lot for the last five years, haven't you? Around yeah. London and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I've been gigging for about, well, yes, five years this year. Um, and so what went into the book, there was a few pieces which I've been working on um, and performing and adapting and uh, sort of lived with me for a couple of years. Um, and I finally put them down on paper. Um, there were a few pieces which were written specifically for the book. And then what I tried to do was kind of link the poems together so there'll be lots of ideas which sort of pop up in slightly different ways in different poems um so that uh, it sort of makes different st threads throughout the book so you've got one which is sort of anti-capitalist and you've got another one which is all about cats 
Um, and yeah, there's different threads in the book. So it's, um, it took a bit of time to put together. Yeah, it must have been really exciting feeling though, seeing it all come together and then sending it off with burning eye and seeing it, like actually holding it. Yeah, actually getting it, uh, opening the box and actually seeing it. Um, and yeah, that was quite a moment. Um, and actually having a copy in my hand is nice. Yeah, absolutely. And Burning Eye, obviously a fantastic publisher. So, um, yeah, great stuff. Well, do you fancy sharing us a poem from, from the collection? Or, or, well, you don't have to from the collection, but you can share any, anything you want, really. But might I, be a nice place to start. Yeah, I'll do one from the collection. It's, um, it's a relatively new one. Um, and I'm going to do it today because, I mean, just last week we had this thing where the government decided it'd be a really good idea to try and ban anti-capitalist teaching materials from the school and they were actually discussing this as an open like an open secret um and published in all the different newspapers and things as if capitalism is an indisputable truth of the universe we can't have yeah. any work against it in the schools which was a, a bit scary so i'm going to read this <laughs> it's called bucket list hmm. capitalism is putting out a fire with a bucket with a trickle of a hole at the base of it, and having to carry said bucket from the lake edge to the seat of it, the fire, that is. And what is your strategy in this? Is it in a steady stream of half buckets, anxiously and hurriedly, backwards and forwards, forwards and backwards, more than enough to make sure of enough? Or is it more conservatively in believing you have time to plug the hole before you go and committing early to that belief that efficiency and a lack of waste, especially in your own energy, is the key? Capitalism is filling the buckets to, with poured possessions to a raging fire made of need. Capitalism is the bucket maker's greed, selling straw as kindling with black market weed. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza, you used to sing to me. That one bucket was enough for Maslow's hierarchy. You used to sing to me, there's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza. That all abundance was about anxiety around security, about the fear of fire that our newsreels bleed. There's a hole in my bucket, you used to sing to me. A bucket, a hole. Capitalism is black market buckets, reselling buckets to stockpile to price fix, reading buckets diplomas at bucket university, studying an amendment in the very definition of freedom, all about buckets and straw and a straw man's deeds. Capitalism is a media obsessed with fires, even the ones with deniers, even the ones we started abroad and still sell the straw to feed. Capitalism is the very idea of buckets, with buckets as seeds and bucket peer reviewed year on year growth in perpetuity and bucket salesmen arsonists, suggesting the blood of refugees is just as good as water and better for the bucket's longevity. It's only thicker when your family, you see. Capitalism is an endless game of buckets, bucketing down with rain. And when into every life some rain must fall, the bucket is a panacea, catch all. Capitalism is our willing acceptance and yet total denial of all of this until we kick it. The bucket, that is. Nice, I like that a lot. Great poem to start off with that quality. Um, on the sort of theme of anti-capitalism i noticed that grim chip is watching am i right in thinking that you've done gigs with poetry on the picket line um i have supported poetry on the picket line but i haven't actually done a gig with them yet because um, okay <laughs> yeah but i've supported them and been down and um put strike funds in the bucket and all of that sort of thing but i haven't actually performed there you're part of the squad you're part of the crew <laughs> like yeah yeah like cool it's, yeah. yeah um so so you've been writing for, well, you've been gigging regularly, I know, for about five years. What Would, would you say that anti-capitalism was one of the main things that drove you to start writing, or is that something that you've developed as you've... Because political poetry is difficult, isn't it? And obviously you're fantastic at it, but it's, it, it takes a while, I think, to sort of get your teeth into it. Yeah, I mean, I didn't start as a political poet. It's, it's, um, I mean, when I first started um, with poetry, it was when I was a teenager at school, um, when I first started, performing poetry I was very much performing poetry romantic poetry about trees and lakes and rivers and all of that sort of thing the the, the typical thing um, and I had one poem which was um, about race and it kind of mentioned it as an aside more than anything um, it was a romantic poem again um, mentioned it as an aside more than anything um, and then about six weeks after I performed it for the first time 
in London, I was at another gig and someone came up to me and said, oh, you're the guy that did that um, really wonderful race poem last time. Um, and I think I just had this moment of sort of penny dropping of thinking, if I'm going to get known for that anyway, I might as well do it and do it properly. Um, yeah. And it, <laughs> it just kind of uh, became a thing. It's just, I, I'm going to, if, if people are going to remember that about me, I might as well do it properly and actually um, say what I mean. Um, rather than let them infer things. Well, it was obviously there, like subconsciously, like sort of poking its head out, and some, like you say, it's almost happened organically, which I think that's fantastic. That's really good. Um, so you speak, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, you speak about race in Tales from Viewer Box because you you class yourself as multiracial. Is is that right? Yeah. And it's like that, like you know, being pushed into boxes and classic, you know, labels and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's that thing, There's the, you do those census forms or, or the ethnic mo monitoring forms. Um, and uh, for me, it's kind of, it's always been a difficult thing because there, there have always been more than one box that I could tick, um, inevitably end up ticking black other. Um, and if they have a line to explain, you kind of explain it. Um, but it, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's it, it not really fitting into any of the night neat classifications that people have. It kind of makes you more aware of things, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I understand that you, you spoke, there was quite a few things that you were speaking about where you never quite fit into one box or the other, even like being a middle child, I, I know it said in the bio. So that, that must be quite a frustrating thing to constantly feel yourself trying to fit into because society sort of dictates what we do, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, society likes you to fit in um, to neat little boxes, um, but people don't. We, we live in we live in a continuum. Everyone's an individual. Everyone's, you know, the two people on either side of a line on a on a box um, are often closer together than the two people sort of furthest away you know furthest away I, i'm more similar to other mixed race people than i am to um someone living in ghana who, who is yeah. Ghanaian. whereas i have gone in in my roots but i'm i'm closer to other mixed race people in the uk than i am to to Ghanaian family that i have back home in a lot of ways yeah i think you have to have um you have to have an understanding that that on that continuum, where you fit on that continuum, who you're speaking for, who you're speaking to, um, yeah, it's it's just an, yeah, <laughs> it's something which is endlessly interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I, I love I love the title of a collection. Obviously, Tales from the Other Box. I think it's fantastic, um, and it reminded me of um, one of Selena Godden's essays in uh, The Good Immigrant, which was like I tick other, and it's all the people who tick other, and I, it's just I, it's, it's fascinating. Um, yeah. Um, so do you fancy sharing us another poem? I'm. Yeah, I'll do uh, the first poem in the book, which is rather unimaginatively called First Words. Um, first Words. For years you bite your tongue. Moderate your rage. Play dumb. Pretend you don't hear what they say. Maintain a dignified silence. Stay quiet in the face of snarling with your boiling blood, one drop polluted with fight and flight where neither is appropriate. This is an office job, not a pub, so you bite your tongue. You ignore the patronising tones, even though your education, both street and academic, means that you know better than they assume, and they assume they know better than you. You maintain a dignified silence. Allow them to explain how your personal experience is wrong, is far-fetched, and there is familiarity to their contempt. You pretend that shop floor security aren't playing chaperone as you browse. You keep your head down as not to arouse suspicions or any evidence. You touch nothing because evidence. You keep calm while explaining for the thousandth time that day why it isn't okay to profile in this way. It is a heated exchange and you know why, but play dumb when asked to explain. You bite your tongue. This is not the hill to die on. You respond politely to where are you from? Again, and again, and again. Explain the region, and then the city, and then the town, and then the street, and then the maternity ward. Reductio ad absurdum, get bored, so you go the other way. Explain the country and the continent. The planet, our interstellar neighbourhoods, the galaxy of possibilities they refuse to see. You are never from where they need you to be. 
and there is familiarity to their contempt. So you bite your tongue. You listen to others explain how you don't belong in the land that you were born, the only one that ever kept you warm. You keep smiling, a little lopsided now. Your tongue is swollen, heavy from all the biting. You smile, but not with busy teeth, not like the cartoons, not like the Jim Crow ones. You don't dance anymore for fear of compliments. You bite your tongue, you bite your tongue, you bite your tongue. Remembering what your parents said once, it is not your job to hold the lantern to show others out of the dark. Until suddenly one day you wake at a ripe old age, realizing the lantern was never for them or to light their way. It was yours alone, a reminder of the sun. There is familiarity to their contempt, but there is fight and flight upon your tongue. Wow, God, that's so powerful, like amazing. When did you write that? Did you write that um, fairly recently with it being the first in the book? Was it, was it something that you felt propped or was it, well, sorry, I'll let you answer. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I wrote it uh, probably 2018, towards the end of 2018. It was a really, right. um, we talk about this year being like strange and bizarre, but it's only strange and bizarre to date i'm pretty sure 2021 will be stranger because if we remember 2016 or you remember 2018 there were plenty of things that were happening that were pretty weird um and 2018 was the year of the windrush scandal um and this poem was written in response to quite a lot of what was going on in conversations about race in and around the windrush scandal when that happened so that that's where quite a lot of the story was quite a lot of the stories that inspire the poems in the book came from that that year so yeah amazing well it's, it's like i say it's such a powerful poem um yeah it's been quite a mad like since you started performing in 2015 it's it's been bonkers hasn't it like brexit and then trump and then like you say windrush scandal and grenfell and yeah it's crazy times but all the more reason to be a poet i suppose well yeah um i i did I had a joke with someone a little while ago that maybe uh, the Mayans were right and the world did actually end in 2012 and this last eight years has just been a simulation. Um, but yeah, it's been weird. <laughs> it's been weird. I, I suspect it's going to get weirder. Yeah, probably will. And Bowie as well. I think Bowie died in 2016 and that was that song five years. And yeah, it seems like... Anyways, um, ta would you fancy um, reading another poem for us? Sorry, I'm conscious that I'm asking you too many questions and... Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear more poetry if you're up for it. Okay, no, that's, that's cool. Um, I'm going to do... Uh, yeah, we'll do this one. And I wonder how many of my white friends cite me in those conversations. In their, I have black friends defence in those conversations. And I wonder how many of them have passed me in the street without seeing me as he just did, conditioned not to see black faces at rush hour. And this thought in repetition in those weeks when the phone doesn't ring, this thought in repetition on lonely mornings on the ward, rumbling, threatening the newly built Jenga towers of talk therapy with restless legs, with lack of sleep, with side effects, with tremor after tremor, tick, tick, tick. She asks me how I manage being so extroverted with all this her stabilizing hand cheating the system. She is not a friend, but at least she sees me, sees me regularly, dispassionately reassures, restores foundations, tick, tick, tick. For at this hour, self-doubt like me has time and place to be. Beautiful. Yeah, that was wonderful. Um, have there any gigs in particular over the last five years that have stood out for you? Like any sort of moments where, you, I know like, you know, the person commenting said, oh, you wrote the race poem. That was obviously a pivotal moment. Have there been any other, for whatever reason, any standout gigs? Standout gigs. Um, I, I think watching, watching gigs has been, you know, whether it's music or sort of going to clubs or events in my life, I love gigs. I like, love gigs. And I think I love being in the audience more than performing um i think my favorite gig moment was probably um seeing uh, roger robinson just after um he had won uh his uh, paul, paul paradise had won um 
and he gigged at oh crikey jaw dance that's what it's called jaw dance um and it the room was just electric and it was it was one of the most incredible poetry nights i've been to um Tung Fu, also a great night. Um, saw Jake Wilde Hall performed there. Um, he actually got the entire crowd dancing at one point. Um, I just think that there, there is, it's an incredible honor to be able to get up in front of people and share your vision of, of how you see the world or, or, or your art, your creativity and have them enjoy it and have them yeah. um, respond to it. it. It's like, it's the greatest privilege. And I think it's, it's very addictive. Um, but watching people that do it really well and being in the audience when they're doing it really well is probably my favourite thing. So. Fair play. Yeah, and we, we're so lucky in London as well. Aren't we? Like you say, it's such a vibrant scene and such such great nights. Um, they are all over the UK as well. I'm not just being London-centric about it. Obviously, us living in London, you do. Yeah. Um, great. Well, we've got just under 10 minutes, so I'm, I'd love to hear more if, if, if you're up for it, but also I don't want to pressure you. If you've got any <laughs> others that you want to share. Uh, yeah, I'll do... Uh, I'll do a couple more. Um, yeah, we've got 10 minutes. So yeah, we'll do, we've got... Yes. <laughs> I was feeling awkward, like, do another one, do another one, but I'm like, it's, it's so exciting. Uh, this is uh, Lifting the Lid. Cool. I always felt that Schrodinger's cat was black. So damned familiar to be that experiment of the white man, to be put in a box, to be both alive and dead and theoretical for the sake of someone else's critical thinking, for the sake of someone else's education, just an impossible image inside someone else's head, subjugated, subjected, sold and bred and made undead by this our shared history that neglects to mention how the torture and murder of small animals is actually an early warning sign of psychopathy. But you know this already. And I know this intimately, having an affinity with that moggy frequently while out jogging, doing laps at dawn and watching others scorn as they cross themselves and cross the street to keep away from me, to keep me from crossing their path. And you may laugh, but I always felt that Schrodinger's cat was black. So damned familiar, that feeling of being or not being at the whims of fate, the superpositions and quantum states of a number one for weeks, sexual fantasy and the lynch mob scapegoat simultaneously this eternal duality of the word hung. About being cracked once by a white man to say hanged as if by way of reparations or apology, he should improve my grammar and silence me subtly. Put a lid on me, bottle me and store me away in the cool and dark place as if being seen and heard might change me and make me real instead of this velveteen victim of the white man's burden that he'd now rather forget and stuff in a box with a poison pill to be dispatched, to be euphemistically lost. And so, like Schrodinger's cat, I'm both fully assembled and flat packed, numbered irrationally, the root of two worlds. Some insist are mutually exclusive, black and British. Two worlds squished and sealed into this to be or not to be by this imperial measurement in these ghetto experiments, to be or not to be poisoned by this maddening society that both co-opted and rejected me, adopted and neglected me, and still imagines me taking jobs while stealing welfare simultaneously and continuously puts me in a box and then ends up hating that box when it comes to define me and leaves it feeling all the guilty of its acts, recalling its history, our shared history, founded on all the murders we committed and rather not see. Early warning signs of psychopathy, that mutability of facts. So you see, I always felt that Schrodinger's cat was black. So damned familiar to me was his story. This duality of being and not being forever at the mercy of those out there doing the scene and their curiosities. And please, don't get me started on my bisexuality. <laughs> nice. I like that. That's quality. I love just, yeah, as soon as you started, with, it's just such, you just got such a beautiful way of framing it. And obviously there's such complex and sensitive and ever changing ideas. And I just love the way that you, yeah, I think it's brilliant. Thank you. I'm so glad that you could do this session. Like it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to reading the new collection as well. It's one of them that's on my like to buy list, but like, obviously, you know, as a poet, you get so many books and it's like, you know, no, but oh, it's just brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah, no, I don't and it'd be great to see you do it live. Sorry, go on, sorry, go on. No, no, I was just saying, I know exactly what you mean. I, it's that thing of you have to limit the number of books you buy a month, otherwise you'd end up spending your food money on it. I, it's, um, 
yeah, I, I fell into that trap at early part of lockdown. And I think I bought about 20 books in the first month. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, I'm not, not going anywhere. I'm not going out. So I might as well buy books. And I bought so many yeah. books. And yeah, this is like that. We've got Burning Eye. We've got Verve. We've got Bad Betty. Like, there's so much good stuff coming out. It's like, ah. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, buzzing. Um, so yeah, if you, if you fancy sharing one more, that'll be wonderful. It's just gone five to, so. Perfect. I will finish with, yeah, I'm gonna finish. I'm gonna finish with this one. I, 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 I heard it first at seven. The day they called me Gollywog. And as the word passed these lips to meet Mum's ear, a tear. And every time since then, I'm back there, little boy lost there, wondering when I will grow up, praying and praying and praying like that's ever been enough that this world will too. Strange then that this was to my childhood's very end there in an 80s living room as mum and dad and I have the chat. And my dad tells the tale, regales it again and again in his final days about his early years on this isle, how only black in the village was actually a thing and how it was him and how on a summer's day no more than eight, a policeman at the gate came to tell his mum he couldn't go to the corner shop alone again. He hadn't stolen anything, but the shopkeeper, like so many back then, wasn't one for details except the simple single one that still holds us back. So later that evening, Granny and Grandad give my eight-year-old dad the chat. And I rehearsed it with a girlfriend. Same night as our first tiff, late on the date about 2003, the year, not the hour, as she suggests we hail a cab. And her privilege hits me there. Hits me square, hits me full force in the derriere. I won't be able to flag one here. I snap, snarky, inferring, maybe it should be you in the flooded gutter in your good shoes. And later that evening, as I'm cleaning her boots, she and I have the chat. Because that's how it's been for generations. Parents to their children, star-crossed lovers in explanation, in conversation after conversation, explaining how being black, but having some advantages will get you treated as lesser by some, make you a target to some, will put you in the crosshairs of some. And this is something a quartet of Carl Lewis, Linford Christie, Usain Bolt and Jesse Owens can't outrun. It's a baton that we're still passing. And this is me to you, my son, because that's how I'll have to give it to my boy. So I hope this world will grow so you never truly know this feeling of being so conspicuous and yet so small. Of representing an entire skin tone all on your own, all on your own alone. Because I know whenever you feel the weight of that, it will crush you flat. And you deserve to be on show only when you choose to be. And hopefully, one day. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, haven't seen boy, I haven't seen my boy in about uh, what, so long lockdown um, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. only when you choose to be and now you're fully grown and in possession of our truth and I know you guard it well until it's due but I hope and pray like that's ever been enough that this ends with you and hopefully one day a black man merely putting pen to a page will stop being a political act but until then we'll have the chat Wow, absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning, man. I'm <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> well, it's no, beautiful. I wasn't expecting that. That was so a... beautiful. Well, no, it's a powerful piece, and like, there's nothing wrong with getting emotional. Is there? I don't know why. I don't know why people always apologise for uh, for getting upset. Like, it's it's a perfectly beautiful thing. Um, mate, I'm so privileged that you shared that with us tonight. I'm really, really lucky, and you're getting all the the digital uh, love hearts and plenty of comments and stuff as well. I know people are really loving it. So I'm going to be uploading it to IGTV and YouTube and Facebook and that jazz. But um, buying the book, have you got any yourself or should people get it from Burning Eye? I have got, I have got a few copies left, um, but they can get it directly from Burning Eye as well. And all good bookshops, yeah. um, support your local bookshops if you can. Um, and uh, yeah, they should be able to order it because for, for the ISBN. So you can support your local bookshop. You can order it from me or Burning Eye. Uh, feel free to not order it from Amazon. Um, <laughs> uh, but other than that, yeah, great. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your time and sharing your poems. And hopefully I'll see you on stage at another time in the not too distant future. And also, I've just got to show you this. 
Oh, uh, it's, not, it's not mine. It's not mine. I promise you. <laughs> you did us a favour on Sunday, to be fair, big time. Uh, it was, um, I couldn't. Put, I, Sunday was the most insane day, and I was recovering from a migraine, um, and I sort of rolled over. And you, the really weird thing about recovering from a migraine is you're never quite sure um, whether you're awake or asleep. Uh, and I rolled over and saw that Spurs were four-one up against Man United at half time, and I was convinced I was still asleep. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a strange day, Sunday. Quality. Well, thank you, mate. Much appreciated. I'll see you soon. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, that was the wonderful Rick Dove uh, sharing uh, tales from Viva Box, which, as we said, is out now on Burnley Night Books. So get them from Rick or from Burnley Night or uh, your local independent bookshop, they can order copies in as well. So do that. Um, yeah, give Rick a follow. My name's Matt Abbott. We're adding some fugs. We're back next week, 7.30 to 8. Cheers.